perhaps the number one need for Philadelphia. They had perhaps considered trading for Johnny Mitchell. They didn't make that trade for a fairly expensive guy, instead using the draft pick there on Jason Dunn out of Eastern Kentucky. Why not make the trade and why take the, the guy from Eastern Kentucky? Well, they're going to have to get Johnny Mitchell signed to a long-term contract, which is going to require to give him a higher cap number. Jason Dunn, they know they have him for four more years, so you weigh the two options. The other alternative is they have to wait and see what the Jets are going to do because the Jets are tight to the cap and they may in fact release Johnny Mitchell, so why trade for a player that may in fact be released? So patience is a virtue right here. Jets may be asking for too much in that trade. You're right, they may have to cut him loose and then it's open season on Johnny Mitchell, the sought after tight end. Now back to New York and Chris. All right, Chris and Mike, and uh, thank you very much. We have uh, six picks left in the second round. The Packers, you know what? There's a receiver or two left, and I... They do throw the ball. Out of the draft, Baltimore has just taken Deron Jenkins, defensive back Tennessee, but a long, long while ago, long around lunchtime, with the fourth overall selection, they took 6'8", 318-pound Jonathan Ogden. Uh, they also picked Ray Lewis, linebacker Miami, but Jonathan Ogden, the big tackle projected to be a 10-year starter in the National Football League from UCLA. Tom Jackson spent some time with uh, Ogden both on the field and in the film room as we get to know him as a player and as a student. Physical specimen is how most have described Jonathan Ogden from UCLA. At 6 foot 8, 318 pounds, he has the potential to be a franchise left tackle. They've raved about his strength and discipline, and he knows his main job will be protect the quarterback. Two key ingredients for any left tackle in the NFL are his hands and his feet. Jonathan, let's begin with your hands. I'm coming at you on a wide rush. What do you do? Well, with my hands, the first thing I like to do is get them inside the framework of the defender's body and then get a good punch on them to initially shock them. And then once I clamp onto him, it's pretty much over when I lock out my arms. And you can see the tremendous wingspan. Once he gets his hands on you, the pass rush is over. So what guys will try to do is to beat him by beating his feet. Jonathan, as an outside linebacker, I'm going to try to beat you with quickness. I come to you, I make that move right there. What are you doing? Well, I'm trying to use my feet and my quickness to maintain inside position in order to make it difficult for you to come back to the inside and get to the quarterback with a straight line. And I'm trying to force you to my strength, which is going to be to ride you past the quarterback and just keep you outside and make, let the, create a pocket so the quarterback can step up. Now, with Jonathan's size and with his strength, guys will try to beat him by keeping him off balance. As long as he keeps his leg tight inside and forces guys to his strength, he's going to be awfully hard to beat. Jonathan, we talked about the importance of your hands and your feet when you play offensive tackle in the NFL. We didn't talk about quality of talent across the line of scrimmage. It's always going to be the other team's best defensive lineman. How do you deal with some of the rushes we're going to take a look at here? Um, just a lot of film study and practice and knowing how to use your feet and keeping the, your feet always staying balanced to the inside. Don't lean. Keep putting your hands in the right spot on different types of rushes. Because, I mean, if you don't know someone's favorite move, everyone has a favorite move they like to try to do and try to get, beat you with. And if you know how to take that away, you've already got half of the battle won right there. As we take a look at Reggie White doing the hip toss on Larry Allen, what could Larry have done to prevent this move? Well, his feet are moving pretty good right now, but when he tries to punch, he leaned to the outside a bit and put his head down. And when that happened, his momentum was already going outside, and Reggie just came underneath with the club, and with his strength, he just threw him to the ground. So always the importance of staying balanced, no matter how tall, no matter how big. Exactly. If you stay low and balanced, it's really difficult to throw you in. I mean, if you're Reggie White, it's the greatest pass rush of all time. It's not that hard, but <laughs> against most people, it's going to work for you. Nice job, Tommy. Now let's bring Tommy in from Carolina headquarters. And uh, Tom, I got to say, in looking at that scene with you and Jonathan Ogden on the field, it looked like a jockey. <laughs> <laughs> standing, I, standing next I know. to him. Obviously, that was the first thing that hit you. This guy's big, huh? <laughs> well, he, he, he's, he's big, but I think that he's such an odd combination of that kind of size and strength that we see from him, along with an attitude that's one of a finesse player because he realizes he has such quickness and agility with his feet. So a very odd combination, Chris, but I think that he takes full advantage of it. He's an outstanding shot putter. Uh, I don't know if most people know that, who may qualify for the Olympic team, if not this year, certainly maybe in the year 2000, if, if he's allowed to, to take the time to train for it. So he has tremendous upper body strength, but he has very quick, agile feet. 
Tommy, when you were playing, or even now, it doesn't matter. If you're a linebacker rushing a, a tackle, forget the size for a moment, but the a tackle with this sort of athletic ability, mm -hmm. what different problems did he pose to either a defensive end or a linebacker? Because, obviously, he can move, but you don't see that many guys this fluid, this size at that position. Therefore, was he hard to solve, a guy like this? Well, I think certainly hard to solve because most times your rush is coordinated as an outside linebacker with the guy inside of you. And what we see most often is guys trying to get to the outside and cut the corner and make that corner what we call a little bit shorter. Well, you've got a very difficult time doing that with Jonathan Ogden. Number one, he's going to plant that inside foot, force you to go outside, and then he has arms that are about as long as my legs. So when it comes to him pushing you by, by the, uh, the quarterback, he's going to be able to do it 90% of the time. Well, it, it certainly is a good thing he wasn't playing it. Not that you wouldn't have gotten by him every now and then, but really, you, look, you were looking you were looking at his kneecap, it looked like, part of the time. Well, uh, I'm sure you enjoyed getting together with him. He's, he's quite a player. Should be for Baltimore for a long time. Green Bay has made a selection, and we got involved in some things, but at least the guys here will give me some credit. I think Mike Holmgren is... Of all the names that he thought that they'd have in the second round, he gave me about four or five names. Derek Mays was the last wide receiver in the group that they were hoping would fall, and Green Bay has selected the very productive wide receiver from the University of Notre Dame. Notre Dame. From Notre Dame. ND. That's right. And uh, so Notre Dame gets on the board, and, and after Mike Holmgren got to pick a USC guy, Michael's a tackle in the first round. Balance it out. Sterling Sharp, I mean, I guess it, it's just like some teams think about pass rushers. Sterling, you can't have enough wide receivers, I guess, if you're in Green Bay. And, and maybe Mays provides something a little different than what they have up there right now. Do you like the pick? Certainly like the pick. I think because of the, the, the youthness of Robert Brooks and I think that whole offense being young, they really don't have a number two guy right now. And this guy right here can be it. I mean, Antonio Freeman had a good year last year coming off the bench. But the one thing is Mays has got good stuff. Great transition player, great body control, and, and really goes after the football. And the one thing he, he had the ability to do in, in Notre Dame was be the guy. So he's a guy who understands body control, understands positioning. And uh, like I said about all the guys in the draft, they believe in yards after the catch. He's got good quickness. And once he gets around Robert Brooks and some guys like Antonio Freeman and understand what the West Coast offense is all about, learns how to play a little smaller, I think this guy could be a real steal here in the second round because he's been in a position to where he can make huge plays like this, taking the ball to the house. He's a player that's self-motivated. You're not going to have to worry about whether he's going to show up on Sunday or not. And I, th I think the one thing is, is that his body-wise, he's 200 pounds, but I don't think he's a real weightlifter. He plays stronger than he really is, and I think a lot of teams might have thought that pounding-wise, his body couldn't take the pounding. But uh, I think it's a good pick for Green Bay. He should do well in the West Coast offense. Let's go to Morton. Well, Sterling, some people think you, it gets boring this time of the draft, but not for a guy like Jimmy Johnson. He just made another trade, trading two picks, the 60th and 99th, for four picks with Jacksonville. Uh, Jimmy, we saw you in the war room uh, with Bob Ackles making this deal. Uh, what did you accomplish and why? Well, Chris, you know, there's good players in the second round, but we said last night that we were going to probably trade out of the second round into the third and fourth round for the simple reason. That's where we had projected some of the guys that we needed to go. And so, uh, you know, right now we've got two picks in the third, two in the fourth, three in the fifth, one in the sixth, and two in the seventh. We'll be able to get some players that actually fit our needs now. Is money a factor at all in this? No, I, it was more of where these players were projected to go. Uh, the players that we needed weren't projected to go in the second round. They were projected to go in the third, fourth, and fifth round. And so that's where we needed our picks to be. You never know until down the road. But, I mean, I, we talk about this. The Stepnoskis, the Eric Williams, the Tolberts, the Leon Leth, Larry Browns, Bar Brock Marins. You found these guys this time of the draft, the third, fourth, fifth and rounds and beyond. Are you hoping to find that type here? Yeah, there's no question you can find good players in the third and fourth round, and, and that's where we have some of our picks, and so that's where we'll be doing a lot of our work as far as actually picking players, not trading picks. Anything dramatic from this point on? No, we made a trade with Jerry, and it was very smooth. <laughs> it did? How did that go down real quickly? Well, yeah, that's the good thing about uh, Jerry. You can make a phone call and, and say, hey, here's what we'll do. Uh, he understands the value. I understand the value. And uh, you might say it was fair for both sides. And, uh, and so uh, he was able to make the call right there. We didn't have to go through a, a, a committee of four or five people making decisions. All right, with Jimmy Johnson, let's go back to New York with Chris Berman. All right, guys, thank you very much. There are five picks left in the second round. Oakland is up next. I know in your chart it says New England will explain the trade in a moment, 
this uh, pick has had a lot.